The talent shortage in the accounting profession is real and growing. There are ways to stem the tide, though, and today we're going to talk about a few of them. My name is Suzanne McCann-Perry, Director of Strategic Communication for the Ohio Society of CPAs. Today we're going to talk about the benefits of hiring neurodivergent candidates. My guests are Anthony Pasilio, Vice President of Neurodiverse Solutions for CAI, and my colleague Tiffany Crosby, Chief Learning Officer for the Ohio Society of CPAs. Welcome to both of you. Thank you for having me. Thank you. So Anthony, I'd like to start with you. What exactly is neurodiversity? Neurodiversity is human brain variations, um, but it comes out in different respects, such as uh, memory pattern recognition, alternate problem solving skills, among many other skills. But neurodiversity is also kind of a, a big tent. It encompasses autism spectrum disorder, ADHD, social anxiety disorders, mood disorders, PTSD, and a plethora of others. Perfect. So what skill sets do neurodivergent candidates have to offer the accounting profession? Well, there, there's a wide variety of skill sets. Um, you know, these capabilities are typically ideal for careers in finance, accounting, other related fields, because of how neurodivergent individuals closely analyze data with a strong attention to detail. It's, it's that process-oriented thinking that can identify data trends and deliver results. For sure. What is the best way for organizations to approach an interview with a neurodivergent candidate to ensure that both sides find the process to be mutually beneficial? Yeah, it needs to be a simplified approach first. We want to get away from panel interviews. We want that one-on-one -on -one candidate to hiring manager time. We don't want that time to be hours long because people are already anxious about interviewing. With someone who's neurodivergent, that escalates tenfold. And what it really needs to be is in chunks of 20 to 30 minute interviews so that the hiring manager and the individual can get comfortable within that in environment and the hiring manager can concentrate on that individual skill set. So explain why the um, panel approach is probably not a good idea. Yeah. So panels have multiple individuals and focus and concentration is got to go left to right, right to left, back over here. What we're trying to elicit when we do interviews is can that person do the job? Do they have the aptitude and the skill set to do that job? If we're kind of punching questions left and right and every you know minute or so, it doesn't give someone the time to process what they're hearing. And sometimes with neurodivergent individuals, there can be processing delays. So you might not get that quick response. And given the way that typical interviews are set up with a panel, is it best to break those down into um, interviews with one-on-one -on -one, um, individuals and do it over several days? Or can you do one-on-one -on -one interviews over a period of the same day, same time? Yeah, I, I would probably advise against doing elongated days like that. Um, it, different school of thought would be, you know, we would like 20 to 30 minute interviews, two, maybe three. What we're really trying to get at is staying away from nine or 10 interviews for one job. We're, we're trying to get to where hiring practices can be two to three people and make that decision. So once a hiring decision has been made, what can organizations do to ensure the success of neurodivergent candidates? Yeah, the, fir the first thing is be supportive, right? What supportive looks like is being inclusive, having mentorship, ensuring workplace accommodations are available. Because in order to bring someone's authentic selves to work there, they might need some minor accommodations. Someone needs noise canceling headphones, a visual aid. Um, you know, and with us, we get a neurodiversity certified team lead, which typically will help that individual in the organization and or business uh, acclimate and support the team members in their new work environment. We build up mentorship because we know that retention of neurodiverse talent is achieved with a strong uh, foundation. So I want to switch gears a little bit and talk with my colleague, Tiffany. Tiffany, how can adding neurodivergent candidates enhance an organization's diversity? When I think of what neurodivergent individuals bring to the table, 
think one of the things it does is it challenges thinking, right? That that pattern recognition, that that deeper thought, that just looking at things differently. And that's really what diversity of thought is all about, is making sure that you are bringing all of these different perspectives, because we all have blind spots. We all have a frame of reference in the way that we look at information that has been shaped by our experiences, shaped by our cognitive patterns, habits, all of those things. And so when you bring in someone who has a different pattern of thought than what you have, you're gonna get different types of questions. You're gonna get different insights. And that really is what sharpens the decision-making process that we go through from a standpoint of, of having that, that robust decisioning occurring in a very complex environment. So we want that and we need that. Tiffany, we talk a lot at OSCPA about culture and the importance of culture in attracting and and especially in retaining. What steps can organizations take to create that welcoming environment for neurodivergent candidates? I think it begins with a recognition that this is not a burden or an obligation or a duty, this is really how we should be thinking about all talent because the reality is we all have some level of diversity that we are bringing in. And so how are we creating an environment that recognizes all of that different aspects of diversity? We have in the past talked about introversion and extroversion. Right. And how that changes how you do meetings or might change how you do some of those type of things. Well, it's the same type of concept here where we're just saying this is another element that really should cause us to step back and be intentional about how are we designing our space? How are we conducting our meetings? How are we holding team events? And are we considering that some environments might be a little too chaotic or have too much going on, uh, sensory overload, and, and how do we accommodate that? It doesn't mean that we necessarily take it away, but there might need to be a mix of different environments within the same space so that people can operate in the environment that works best for them. There are some people that are charged by interacting with people and they want to be around people all the time. And that's great. And they they want those fluid conversations and they don't mind the interruptions every 10 minutes. That's how they operate. There are others that that would be very detrimental. So really having that perspective of this inclusive environment is to me the challenge of leadership of how do we really start to think about this and recognize that there is more than one way of working and it's not right or wrong it's just different right you know we we just got done talking about some things some considerations for the neurodivergent candidate but what are some considerations for the supervisors of neurodivergent candidates what additional support might they need to ensure that they're providing quality leadership i think one of the things that a supervisor needs to think about is when it comes to their interactions right just intentionality, thinking about what is what is the environment like that we're holding this conversation in? How much time has I have I set aside for this? Right, uh, and making sure that both of those are sufficient, and then really trying to just like they would with any other person, understand how best do I interact, how best do I mentor, how best do I support? Again, not creating an additional burden is what we would do with any other candidate, right? This idea of a personalized development plan, this idea of really getting to know your team member and how they best work and whether they need more hands-on, hands-off, how much direction they need, all right? And, and really trying to customize that. I think one thing they would need to do, though, is also make sure that they are not operating off of mis conceptions or perceptions off of myths, right? And this idea of 
these images that have been played out in media or in movies or other things. And, and so really challenging themselves that they are actually taking time to learn that person and that they're not operating off of a stereotype. Good thoughts, good insights. Um, Anthony, what additional considerations have we not covered today that we should um, make sure we surface? Well, I think it's most important to, to understand where that individual is going in from a cultural perspective as well, right? We want to have a welcoming environment. We want organizations to understand um, that individuals, and it should be universal design, right? People coming in uh, should have whatever they need to do their job successfully, but more importantly, so that they're successful, but they are having rewarding, meaningful careers as well. Excellent. Well, that's all we have time for today. Thank you both for your excellent insights on this topic. Thank you.